Chapter Twenty Three of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, July two thousand twelve. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter Twenty Three. The Countess of Richmond, fourteen ninety five. Titler. Henry the Seventh is supposed to have been influenced by the advice of his mother, the Countess of Richmond, to whose opinions he was accustomed to listen with deference, and whose amiable qualities were likely to make an impression on her grandchildren. She was, in truth, a remarkable woman, and her dutiful and affectionate biographer, Bishop Fisher, who was also her chaplain, has fortunately left us a fine portrait of her character. Her piety and humility were great, though slightly tinged with asceticism. She rose at five in the morning, and from that hour till dinner, which in those primitive days was at ten, spent her time in prayer and meditation. In her house she kept constantly twelve poor persons, whom she provided with food and clothing, and, although the mother of a king, such was her act of benevolence that she was often seen dressing the wounds of the lowest mendicants, and relieving them by her skill in medicine. She also evinced her respect for learning, both by her own works and by munificent endowments for its encouragement. She was a mother to the students of both universities, and a patroness to all the learned men of England. Two public lectures in divinity were instituted by her, one at Oxford and another at Cambridge, but those generous efforts were surpassed by her last and noblest foundations, the Colleges of Christ and St. John in the latter university. It was right that such a benefactress to knowledge should be embalmed in an epitaph by Erasmus. There can be little doubt that the advice and instructions of this exemplary woman must have had a considerable influence in directing the education of the royal progeny, and we may perhaps trace to the influence of her example that early love of letters which was shown by young Henry. Erasmus, who was then in England, has left us so pleasant a picture of the royal schoolroom at this time, that I need make no apology for introducing it. Thomas Moore, says he, who had paid me a visit when I was Montjoy's guest, took me, for the sake of recreating the mind, a walk to the next country seat. It was there the king's children were educated, with the exception of Arthur, who had then attained majority. On entering the hall the whole of the family assembled, and we found ourselves surrounded not only by the royal household, but by the servants of Montjoy also. In the middle of the circle stood Henry, at that time only nine years old, but bearing an expression of royalty, a look of high birth, and at the same time full of openness and courtesy. On the right stood the Princess Margaret, a girl of eleven years, afterwards married to James the Fourth of Scotland. On the left was Mary, a child of four years of age, engaged in play, while Edmund, an infant in arms, completed the group. Moore, with Arnold, our companion, after paying his compliments to little Henry, presented a piece of his own writing. I forget what it was. As for me, I was not anticipating such a meeting, and having nothing of the kind with me, I could only promise that I would shortly show my respect for the prince by some similar present. End of chapter 23